This meeting is What is the Dialectic by uh, Camilla Royal. She's uh, the Deputy Editor of International Socialist Journal. Uh, this is the first of a course on an introduction to the Marxist method. Um, I think that's all you really need to know. Um, and off you go, Camilla. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so Karl Marx famously said, um, philosophers have only interpreted the world, the point is to change it. So if Marx is right and the point is to change it, shouldn't we, why are we in here talking about philosophy? Shouldn't we all be in the other meeting talking about what next after the election? Um, now I'd say that actually what Marx is saying is not that we ditch philosophy and just focus on action. What he's saying is that we want to change the world, we want to act in the world, change the world around us. But to do that we also need to understand the world and to understand how things are changing in the world and how things can suddenly change very quickly. You can have, for example, years of austerity and cuts and an economic crisis and there can't be very much and there's not very much in the way of resistance for, for many years and then suddenly resistance can break out um, <coughs> in the form of, of Corbyn's great successes in the UK, for example, but of course it can also go the other way uh, with the election of Trump and the rise, rise of the far right. Um, stand up. So, so, so dialectics is a method, it's a method of understanding the world in which we live and it's a method that we use to try and understand how we can better change the world. Um, so, so I would argue that you know, if you want to understand something like the Labour Party today, you need a bit of a, a dialectical understanding of it. Um, many of the revolutionaries that we are inspired by and that we talk about at Marxism have also referred to their method as dialectical. Uh, Marx and Engels, uh, also Trotsky, Lenin, Lukács, <coughs> Hungarian revolutionary, Antonio Gramsci, Rosa Luxemburg, Franz Fanon, and many others have talked about dialectics in their work. Um, and it's, it's a way of understanding how the world actually is. It's not, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's just a kind of, a sort of a thought <coughs> exercise or a, an exercise that we do, do in our heads. It's about, about telling us something concretely about the actual world. Um, so in the words of, of Leon Trotsky, um, you might not be interested in the dialectic, but the dialectic is interested in you. Um, also a, possibly a slightly more um, abstract element of Marxist thinking, um, but I'll, I'll try and illustrate some of the concepts with, with real world examples and then if you stay for the rest of the course we'll talk about alienation and human labour and human history and, and historical materialism, um, which will start to look a bit more kind of concrete and a bit more um, re maybe immediately relevant to how people actually actually live their lives. So, so dialectics, it, it's a bit more abstract, but it's not you know, beyond the realms of, of understanding by any means. Um, so, and the other kind of aspect of it is that, you know, as, as revolutionaries, we're constantly in dialogue with people. We're tr constantly trying to defend our own ideas and our way of understanding the world against people that understand the world in a very different way, that, people, that have common sense ideas. Um, so I'll start with um, you know, what are common sense ideas and where do kind of mainstream ideas come from. Um, a lot of um, our ideas um, uh, come, from, um, at least you know, a lot of our ideas in science, for example, come from you know, what's called the Enlightenment and from, from pre-Enlightenment thinkers. Um, one of those thinkers who was um, you know, really influential, I think, in at least Western philo philosophy was, was Descartes. Um, Descartes. Um, Famously said, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. Um, yeah, and he was a pre Enlightenment thinker, really, but his ideas and, and the ideas of other people of that era, sort of 17th century, were very um, influential on, on what came to be known as, as the Enlightenment. Key aspect of Cartesian philosophy is that you break the world down into subjects and objects. So I'm, you know, I'm a thinking person, I'm, I'm a subject, I act. This table, this is an object, this is, you know, inanimate. You know, I, I, can understand the object, um, but there's a, you know, it's a relationship between, between the subject and the object, but we're separate things. Um, you also have the idea, uh, which was associated with, with Newton, a 17th century thinker and, and liberal politician, that um, nothing really moves until something moves it. So uh, according to Newtonian mechanics, um, if this glass of water is on the table, it will just stay there and it won't do anything until a force comes along and pushes it and moves it. Um, there's nothing inherent about the, the water that makes it move. It moves when something external to it comes along and pushes it. Um, and uh, 
idea related to that is that cause is separate from effect. I'm causing that to move, that the effect is it moving. Um, and the idea that everything can be broken down into separate parts. You can take, if you look at a complex system, you take each part of that system and you can analyse it separately and distinctly and learn something about it. Um, this kind of thinking has actually got science you know, very far. You know, Newton was, was a, a genius to, to come up with that idea, and it's not, it's not wrong. And um, you know, any scientist will tell you that breaking things down into separate parts is quite a, com uh, a sensible way of looking at things. You know, it makes sense to have one person that studies the heart, one person that studies the nervous system, one person that studies the skeleton, etc. But that kind of thinking comes up against, against limitations. Um, the second key thing I want to talk about is Hegel. Um, Hegel was born in 1770 in Germany. Um, he witnessed the, well, he was an observer really, I would say, rather than a witness of the French Revolution, 1789. Um, Hegel and the people that he associated with were fascinated by the revolution and really inspired by it. They saw it as you know, a rational, liberal <laughs> ideas. You know, ideas like liberty, equality, fraternity were actually um, coming into the ascendancy um, and that, you know, that revolution was something to be celebrated. He became more conservative <coughs> in later life, but he still celebrated Bastille Day on 14th of July, uh, you know, raised a glass to Bastille Day every year. Um, I trust, um, sorry, um, Hegel was a real advance on other thinkers that came before him. You know, Trotsky described him as an absolute genius. Um, one advance um, from people like Descartes was that actually where Descartes separated out the subject from the object, for Hegel thought can't be separated from reality. You know, the way we think and the way we do things affects the reality around us and that reacts back on us and affects us. Um, he also saw that there was change in society, that the way that society is, is fragile and can easily be, be broken up and changed into something else. Remember, he, he experienced revolutions and knew them in his time. Um, society unstable, driven by conflict. Um, he discovered laws of history, um, things like change, into quantity, change of quantity into quality, which I'll come on to, development through contradictions, conflict of content and form, um, change of possibility into inevitability. So he's talking about history, but not as history as a succession of one event just happening after the other. It's history with a pattern to it and with history as a process. Um, if people went to Sean Sayers' talk about teleology yesterday, we would have talked much more about this. Um, but Hegel, you know, despite his genius, was also part of um, what's called classical idealism. He wasn't a simplistic idealist, but he was someone that essentially thought that, um, that history is driven forward by ideas, that it's ideas that change, change the world. So once you have one idea, there's contradictions arise within that idea, but what it leads to is the development of another idea, a new idea that's better and more rational and more liberal comes along and replaces it, and that's replaced by more ideas, and it, and it continues forwards like that. Um, so, so, society, so history comes from people's ideas, really. Um, Marx uh, was undoubtedly inspired by Hegel, I think. Um, you know, he referred to it himself, you know, how influenced he was, was by Hegel. He associated with, uh, in Germany, with uh, people who were called the Young <coughs> Hegelians, who were um, followers of Hegel. And you know, used some of Hegel's method. Used, you know, it's an idea about rising from the abstract to the concrete, starting with abstract con concepts and building up a picture of how the world works towards more complicated, um, more complex, and more concrete ideas. Which um, is one thing that he took from Hegel. But um, for Marx, history isn't driven forwards by ideas. History is driven forward by real concrete actions. Um, yeah, Marx even said that history is nothing if not it's entirely made up of the actions of real human beings. And so Marx is a materialist, um, whereas Hegel is, is an idealist. He thinks that we start from the material world that actually exists around us. We start with real human beings and how they relate to the, to the world around them, how we relate to nature, and you build up your picture of how, how society works, works from that. Um, we'll talk more in, in a later session about, about historical materialism and about Marx's ideas of of history and why they're, why they're materialist. Um, so it's often said that Marx took Hegel's ideas, um, whereas Hegel's ideas were standing on their head, Marx put them back on their feet. He turned them into materialist ideas. Um, 
Marx was also, you know, as well as these idealist philosophers, he was greatly influenced by, by materialists, including Charles Darwin, who he was a contemporary of, um, which I don't have time to go into in detail. Um, so what is um, Marx's dialectic? Um, I think what's at the heart of Marx's dialectic is the notion of dynamism. The idea that everything changes, um, that, that you know, nothing stays, stays still. Um, you know, this is not too difficult to understand. I mean, we're often taught that things are the way they are and that they're always going to be going to be the way they are. You know, there'll always be class society, there'll always be racism, there'll always be sexism. You know, people are selfish. That's just human nature. We come across these ideas, these mainstream ideas, um, all the time, really. Um, but for a, uh, a dialectical thinker, you don't start from the way society is at the moment, generalise and think that's how things are and how things will always be. What you start from is dynamism. You start from the idea that everything is always changing. If you see something that, that is the way it is at a certain point, then the question you have to ask is how did it get that way? How did it go from what it was to how it is? And, and do, you know, what are the forces that are going to drive further change? So you start from change rather than starting from, from stasis. Um, yeah, it goes back to Greek philosophy, actually. Her Heraclitus famously said that you can't step in the same river twice. You know, the river has changed when you want to go and step in it the second time. You've also changed, changed as well. Um, so we need to think about not just in terms of, of, of um, particular things or objects, but in terms of the processes that make up those objects. So if you take a wooden table again, and um, yeah, that is something that's currently a wooden table, but we need to bear in mind that you know, it was once a tree, you know, before that it was a seed. Uh, after it's a table, it's going to en end up eventually as a pile of ash or, or whatever. It's, it's you know, at a particular point in a process at the moment. Um, same with anything, same with a society, same with, same with something like the Labour Party or any particular kind of institution as well as, um, as, well as objects. Um, the other point about... Um, yeah, because so David Harvey actually, um, when he talks about dialectics, he, he emphasises this aspect as well. So not thinking in terms of things, but thinking in terms of processes and seeing those processes as only temporarily kind of crystallising in, into things, um, which uh, Engels also actually seems to agree with that perspective when he says that the world is not to be comprehended as a complex of ready-made things, but as a complex of processes. Um, the other aspect of that is that um, motion uh, and dynamism is not something that comes, comes at objects from the outside, it's something that's inherent to, to everything around us. So you know, in contrast to the kind of Newtonian idea of that still until I push it, dynamism and change is inherent to that, that glass of water. You know, it, it's, it's um, you know, turning into, into water vapour um, you know, at the moment, it's not just going to stay that, that way until someone pushes it. Um, to use a quite a quite trivial example, um, human action and human agency is not then external to history. Human agency is is part of history as well. You know, we're helping to bring about change um, through our actions. We're not just you know, sitting to one side and you know watching as Theresa May tries to hold on to a government, for example, and observing that thing. We also we're also engaged in that and play an active role in that. Um, so this is quite again quite different to common sense way of doing things. Um, for a lot of um, right-wing thinkers, uh, basically if you have a society, it's going to, going to stay the same until something, until something comes in and influences it. So they'll say, you know, everything was just fine until all these immigrants came along and now everything's changing. You know, for us, everything has always changed. That's inherent to it. It's not come, something that comes in from a, an outside force that causes society to change, it's, it's the um, processes within that society that are internal to it that cause, that, that drive change. Um, and the second kind of attribute which, which is related to the, the dynamism aspect um, is the idea that the truth is the whole, as, as Hegel said, that we need to see things from the standpoint of totality, that we need to um, look not just at singular events but see them in their wider context. Um, again, this is not um, that um, that complicated. It's not beyond our understanding, um, and there are lots of examples of this in politics as well. Um, one example might be something 
like the Grenfell fire that happened uh, three weeks ago. And you know, it's a tragic event. You know, at one level, it's an event that is an inappropriate renovation of, of a very tall building that co that caused a fire. But of course, it's not just about that. You have to. You can't understand what happened there unless you see the wider context. Unless you understand a bit about the drive towards privatisation that's going on in council housing. You know, a bit about austerity. A bit about inequality. Um, you know, about, about racism, why people have just been ignored, um, you know, ultimately about, you know, at the widest level, about the system that we live in, about a system that is inherently about profit and not about people's, people's lives or safety. Um, and people do understand that, you know, when we see people on these protests, they're drawing the wider, the wider links. And it's why the one event can act as, as a symbol of much wider anger about, about the system that we live in as a whole. Um, you know, another example might be might, might be support for, for Jeremy Corbyn. You know, the, the media doesn't really seem to understand this. They see it as just just about him as an individual that we're all transfixed by his personality or his speaking ability or something like that. Clearly, so you need to understand the context that people are living in um, and, and the way that people are reacting to the austerity that that they faced. And you know, you need to understand why people support his policies. You, know, you won't get very far if you see it just as about him as, as one single individual. Um, at the same time, um, as seeing things in their totality, um, Marxists have also said that the truth is concrete. So it's not about saying that individual events are meaningless or don't matter. Um, individual events do matter, but they also have this relationship with the wider context in which they live. And so you might ask reasonably, you know, why has Corbyn become so popular? Whereas John McDonnell, ran for leader of the Labour Party, didn't even come anywhere close to becoming Labour Party leader, let alone uh, the success that Corbyn has had. It's not that there wasn't capitalism on, on austerity when, when John McDonnell was running. It's you know, some elements of the context are the same, but there's, there's a specific reasons that we have to, to be concrete about and to try and understand, if you want to understand why things are different now than they were a few years ago um, in terms of Corbyn. Um, the next element of the dialectic that I wanted to talk about, um, and this again relates to how we understand continuity and change, uh, is about changes from quantitative change into qualitative change. Um, how you know, things can sometimes happen very slowly, but then things can suddenly shift very quickly. Um, I guess the, the major example of this would be, would be the Russian Revolution. You had Tsarism in Russia, it actually existed from, right, thanks, from, from the 15th century. Um, now, hundreds of years of Tsarism, and then in the space of one year, 1917, Tsarism was, uh, was overthrown. Things can change very slowly and then can suddenly explode into, into, into very quick change and even revolutionary change. Um, again, it's a mainstream, an aspect of mainstream thought to think that everything's just going to change gradually and to ignore abrupt, abrupt change and qualitative change. And um, yeah, the usual example that people give of a quantitative change turning into qualitative change is what happens when, when you boil a glass of water. You know, for a long time, uh, nothing happens to that water other than that it just gets warmer and warmer. When you get to 100 degrees, it changes into something completely different from water. It changes into steam, entirely different properties to, um, to liquid water. So it's a quantitative change into qualitative. Um, you know, of course, uh, revolution is, is much more complicated than, than making a cup of tea, but I think it still makes sense to think about, um, to think about uh, quantitative turning into qualitative, qualitative change, qualitatively different types of, of society that, that are brought about when, when one type of, of system turns into another type of, type of, um, type of system. Um, and in order to bring about that kind of qualitative change, uh, you need to understand that um, that within a particular system there are contradictions within it, um, and sometimes referred to as a unity of opposites. So, in a capitalist system, there are there are processes. Um, as I said it's made up of processes, but these processes uh, come into conflict and contradiction with each other. We don't always see those contradictions <coughs> immediately on the surface. If you think about the surface of that glass of water, you don't see what's necessarily happening to it until it, turn, <coughs> until it boils and turns into steam. But those, those contradictions must be inherent to it, otherwise where would that, that change, that sudden change come from? Um, right, so 
in economics. Um, we've got a capitalist system which tends to grow and tends to expand as um, capitalists uh, compete with each other and try and increase their profits. But at the same time as there is that tendency within the capitalist system, there's also a tendency for, for overall profit rates to decline. So um, without going into the details of the economics, there's, there's tendencies and counter tendencies within the same system that can sometimes balance each other out, but sometimes one tendency can, can overtake and you can get an abrupt shift. Um, this is another difference between um, people like Lenin's understanding of dialectics and the understanding of someone like Hegel, because for Hegel, especially in his later years when he became more conservative, he tended to see history as developing through contradictions, but um, ultimately those contradictions would mediate and balance out um, so that you could resolve the contradictions within society by imposing a strong state that would keep everything in line and kind of mediate those contradictions. You know, whereas for Lenin, those contradictions develop into, into revolutionary si situations rather than just being mediated and, and, and shut down. Um, so that's um, quality and uh, quantity and unity of opposites. Um, this is sometimes, sometimes the idea of the unity of opposites is used um, to say that within a capitalist society um, it will create its own grave diggers really, that capitalism it needs to employ workers and needs to create a working class in order to survive. There's no capitalism without, without workers, there's also no workers without capitalism, so it's, it's the unity of opposites at work there really, but it's often been said that as capitalism creates workers, it will also create its own ultimate downfall because the workers will, will rise up and overthrow it. Um, this is, I think you need to be careful with this kind of idea because when we're talking about, about contradictions in society, we're not talking about something that inevitably causes something to happen. So we can't say that you know, inevitably there's going to be a workers' revolution. Um, the Stalinists tried to, tried to use dialectics to say that... Um, to say that the, the workers' revolution was, was inevitable and also to try and see themselves as the expression of that, that workers' revolution and to see themselves as the inevitable, but part of the inevitable progress of history, try to consolidate their own power by doing that. So although we don't say that, that revolution is inevitable, we don't, I, I try to avoid talking about laws of dialectics because it doesn't cause anything to happen or predict anything to happen, but it does highlight tendencies and potentials within a current system. Um, I think that's sort of the way I would, I would look at it. Um, thanks. So, um, so you can see the influence of, of dialectical thought in, in Marx's work, um, particularly in, in Capital, and, and you know, a, a theory and a way of thinking that, that stresses change and stresses dynamism and says that things won't always be the way where they are at the moment is, is clearly you know, attractive for people that want, want to change things. And there are key points in history, I would argue, where understanding of dialectics has proved, has proved decisive. Um, one of them was Lenin's understanding of dialectics. So um, after the outbreak of, of World War I in 1914, um, socialist parties um, who were part of what's called the Second International, um, around Europe, um, in, most notably the German Socialist Party, uh, ended up actually supporting the, uh, the imperialist war, ended up in Germany they voted for war credits, for example. Now, this was a profound shock for, for Lenin. How can parties that are supposed to be about workers' revolution end up supporting, supporting their bosses' war? Uh, yeah, we think that the world is in turmoil today, but you know, just imagine what, what 1914 would have been about, the turmoil as people you know, across Europe were brought into across Europe and, and more wider, were brought into this, this, uh, this huge, huge war. Um, Lenin, in that situation, he actually spent quite a bit of 1914 um, in a library in Bern in Switzerland, uh, reading Hegel, reading Hegel's Science of Logic. Um, I think um, he said that actually you can't understand Marx without reading the whole of Hegel's Science and Logic, so these, these Marxists don't really understand Marx consequently. And it might seem like an uncharacteristic um, thing to do for Lenin. He's supposed to be this, this man of action and this great leader. Why does he go away uh, and sit in a library? Um, but Lenin actually, I think, came back with a much greater understanding of imperialism and its relationship to capitalism. He calls it the highest stage of capitalism. He, he had an understanding of how 
quantitative changes in the capitalist system had led to a qualitative change, which was the development of imperialism, um, you know, laying the basis for, for a world war, um, also creating at the same time anti-imperialist movements um, in, in First Nations, Ireland, China, other parts, parts of the world. So he'd understood how, how um, capitalism had developed and had changed qualitatively, and how this hadn't... Because um, a lot of Marxists at the time thought that this would, would be sort of the end of... thought that there wouldn't be any more wars, actually. You know, to, that, that it, to, the way that capitalism was heading had led, led to the greatest war that they'd ever, they'd ever seen um, at the time. So, so Lenin made a sharp break with the, the Marxism of the Second International, um, those parties in Germany in particular, uh, which was a kind of a mechanical and deterministic form of Marxism um, towards one where it stresses the openness to change and stresses that things can change can change very quickly. Um, changed his attitude to, to the state as well, to one of not just gradually trying to take over the state, but thinking just gradually we'll, we'll get more and more people in parliament and then that will take over and then we'll have socialism to one, one of smashing the state. So he's, you know, according to Trotsky, he had a a profound ability to, to understand when there were where, when there were shifts occurring or when you needed to intervene and, and what you needed to do in order to, to best intervene when those shifts were occurring. Um, also notably in, in October 1917 when he recognised the need for, for insurrection and led the Bolshevik insurrection. So Hegel's dialectics uh, was a major influence on Lenin before him coming back uh, and leading the Russian Revolution. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's sort of worth, you know, as an add-on, pointing out that you know we're often told that that Marxism is very reductionist and is very determinist, and we just think that that workers' revolution is inevitable, that we just reduce everything down to being about like, the working class, that we're not interested in in wider issues, that we're not interested in in racism and sexism and and so on. You know, that's the kind of crudest form of of the um, of the the objections to Marxism. I guess actually Marxism comes from it has yeah Marx was standing on the shoulders of giants. It comes from this this huge intellectual heritage. I mean, I only talked about a couple of philosophers, but yeah, the, it's a long intellectual heritage of Marxism. Uh, you know, we could talk about, about even go back to the Greek philosophers. He did his doctorate on Greek materialism, and so so Marx was um, able to take on all these ideas of other philosophers, but also to change them and, and adapt them and build on them towards creating his own his own worldview um, along with Engels. And um, so I just wanted to finish on a quote from Marx where he talks about why the dialectic is so important in his worldview. He said, in its mystified form. Um, dialectic became the fashion in Germany because it seemed to transfigure and to glorify the existing state of things. In its rational form, it's a scandal and an abomination to bourgeoisdom and its doctrinaire professors because it includes in its comprehension and its affirmative recognition of the existing state of things, at the same time also the recognition of the negation of that state, of its inevitable breaking up. It regards every historically developed social form as in fluid movement, therefore takes into its account its transient nature, not less than its momentary existence, because it lets nothing impose upon it. It's in its essence critical and revolutionary. Um, I'd just like to ask whether you could explain a bit more about the dialectical process, where it's famous that Hegel goes from thesis to antithesis. <laughs> um, <coughs> just to sort of abstract point. He said, uh, something I don't, he said earlier, um, a famous quote from Marx about how ideas rise from the abstract to the concrete. Mm -hmm. But if it's a materialist philosophy, if we're starting with real living, breathing human beings and the concrete social relations between them, why don't ideas condense out of that to the abstract? Um, what have I misunderstood? <laughs> Um, it, uh, it seems to be quite uh, quite common these days, particularly in uh, social media and other things you find on the internet, to, uh, to talk about dialectics in, in a purely negative way, as, as if it's about uh, completely contradictory things, uh, which which can never never really coincide, and that this is um, used as a way to to essentially stop all all kinds of thought. But I, I would say that um, that's really more of a uh, dichotomistic way of looking at things, having um, 
two things which essentially uh, would never be able to interact, never be able to produce anything else. But the, uh, the key point about dialectics is that it always will allow for uh, moving on to something else. So you have the two elements um, which are opposed to each other, but through their interactions, something else is, is created out of them. Just continuing this thought about uh, the abstract of the material and back again, um, I think I might, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong about this, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that um, when we're thinking about uh, stuff in the abstract, we, we have to start from um, our knowledge of actual concrete facts. Yeah. Um, we start to generalise about those things, we go to, so we go to abstract thought, and then, but that abstract thought is only any use then, if it helps us to then look back again at the, the, the real material world and the real world that we're in. And so uh, I think the answer to your question, it goes back and there's a dialectical thing going on even within uh, that process itself. Um, I just want, I, I wanted to, to thank you for the talk because it may, may, I think sometimes dialectics can seem quite a difficult thing, one of those difficult bits of Marxism, and I discovered recently that I was actually being dialectical from your talk, and oh, wow, I'm cleverer than I think, um, and it was because at my union conference um, in May, um, uh, a speaker got up, a very important researcher of the union, and he told us various things, and he informed us that the Tories were going to win with a landslide. <laughs> and I remember thinking, really? Are you really sure about that? Things could change. And so they did. Um, and I think there's a thing that happens, isn't there, um, for us as socialists? Things seem to come out of nowhere. Struggle just seems to come out of nowhere. Where did that come from? Where did that thing that, you know, people who had experienced those terrible things about Grenfell Tower were actually, you know, uh, 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 invading the, the, the council buildings? Where did that come from? I didn't see those people um, doing anything like that before. Um, and I think that, of course, we know things never come from nowhere. But uh, actually, you know, we, hear, we heard people talking about uh, against Islamophobia and all of those sorts of things. Ordinary working class people that most people think of as not very articulate in all these patronising thoughts. And here they are uh, being very, very clear and very, very articulate and brilliant. And of course, these things come out of actually many years, I think, of struggle, of anti-racist struggle. The, 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 the struggles we, we had against the, against the war in, on Iraq. You know, we had those massive demonstrations, you know, many years ago, and sometimes we felt, oh, well, was it all worth it? Yes, it was, because all of these things actually start to influence people more than we think, and they start to inform people. You know, there comes particular points, I think, in history, uh, a point, you know, when Corbyn has done very, very well and articulated so well our thoughts that uh, Theresa May look, suddenly looks shakier, the Tories suddenly look shakier than we thought they did. There do come points points for people where everything suddenly becomes clear for people, suddenly it all falls into place for people uh, and, and I think that actually what we're living through at this point is, is part of that and so I think it's about understanding that um, struggle never comes from nowhere but that actually every single thing we do Sometimes it seems a bit small, sometimes it seems, feels a bit, uh, uh, a bit ineffective, but actually um, the, all of these things are part of building uh, 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 the, the, the greater struggle that we're going to need to build in order to get a better world. Um, I'd like to know more about the thinking in the society um, in a widened way, in a widened way, um, like she said. Um, because we have the dualism between the individual and the society and it seemed to be to me that your statement was really quite quite similar to the Envy Durkheim, Durkheim when he says that the society is, is on a higher level than the individual so how can I think about it without uh, considering the individual as regardless? Hi, thank you for the talk, it was great. Um, I was just wondering whether you talked a little bit more about um, negation and sublimation. Uh, and also, I think ab abstraction um, as an entity itself, because 
think abstraction is um, economically, when we're talking about use by exchange by these sort of things, is, is an important place because it's sort of where uh, value formation happens. And if you think about sort of uh, exchange value, abstract labor, and then living labor as opposed to dead labor, all of these places exist in a kind of abstract realm um, as a place of, of value formation. And also, I was wondering whether you could talk more about abstraction in relation to materiality as, as we are materialists. And especially as, like, you know, uh, increasingly there's this, uh, this, these ideas around new materialism and uh, uh, sort of distributed agency through uh, forms of materiality. And I mean, that, that kind of school sort of posits, posits itself against Marxism because sees Marxism as reductionistic or this sort of thing. But I don't think that has to be the case because I think some of these new materialist ways of thinking can certainly be interesting from that perspective of uh, abstraction. You all, all been very good, and most of you have actually, you know, spoken about under three minutes, so uh, I've terrorised you all. Um, I'll take uh, this this comrade. And then I'll take okay, so I, I want to move this sideways a bit. So I did a um, I did a, a, a thing about uh, changing career path a year ago, and the plan that they had was basically say, don't just sit there thinking about it. Have a make a plan and then go and act on it. And I think this is not dialectical. This is the fact that you actually move ideas forward and you find out how things get put together when you actually take action. So it's not for nothing that people will talk about Marxism as being philosophy in action. You actually get to do something. To, and it's moving these contradictions together that you actually get to a new place. And there's another thing that you find in project management, I think the dialectics of project management is actually quite scary, but it says find the next step. You do not need to know the end step, you only need to know the next step. And by getting to the next step, you'll then find the step after that. Because you can't see around the corner until you've actually got to here, and then you can see what's happened. And the process and the changes <coughs> that, come, that, that come about by moving to the there will then let you find the next step. Now, this also sounds a little bit abstract, but when you get asked these things like, oh, so what will a socialist society look like? And you go, oh, we don't know. And then you start talking about Paris Commune and things. It's because we haven't got there yet. We haven't had the changes and the, the processes and the getting rid of the things that we're actively seeking to negate as soon as possible. That all hasn't happened, so we don't actually know. But having an appreciation of where this process, how this process will work need a little bit of um, appreciation that there is a process you need to trust that process but you, it helps um, to know that it's okay that we don't know because we're not there yet. Uh, sorry, I'm just resetting my... Uh, yeah, okay, your time. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll bring it in. I'll bring it down to a minute. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there's that wonderful Coen Brothers film, Hail Caesar, where the uh, the Hollywood Communist Party members are all having that meeting, and one of them says, a professor, and he says, yeah, the dialectic, you know, we will win, we will win. And it's that sort of Stalinist view of the dialectic. There's this just thing going on, and a few people know about it, and we just sit and wait for it to happen. And, and that isn't what uh, the dialectic is, as, as, uh, as the speaker said. Uh, I make a living by teaching primary school children. I have to do about Darwin, and I, I love to show them uh, <coughs> off YouTube all those, uh, you know, where people take, uh, they film, say, like a, a, a bowl of fruit over a month, and it slowly, you know, starts to rot, and then it collapses, and then the maggots are all over it. And, but that, I think, is very, very uh, much the, the kind of like, you know, the, the idea of the dialectic as everything is in motion, everything is, is transforming itself. And on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the table is the table and it'll still be there tomorrow and next week. But actually, it is slowly disintegrating and, 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 and so on and so forth. And I think that, uh, that kind of stop-motion photography is fantastic. An electron uh, microscope uh, photographs as well. This, you know, the, the world isn't actually what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, and that these things are happening at this sort of like submolecular level and so on. 
and actually then that can be translated into you know revolutions and societies changing. Just one last thing about the truth is always concrete, which I've been coming to Marxism for years, and you hear that said a lot. And I, I, it's only recently that I've actually think understood what that really means. That actually you have to look at everything in its context, in its process, in its time and place. You know, and, and, and you, you can't be lazy with concepts. You know, it's a couple of examples. You know, when when Lenin gets up to, and says to Trotsky in 1921, Trotsky says we have a worker state. No. We have a worker state that by this point is in all sorts of problems. The working class has been decimated by this and what. We have a worker state with deformities. And that I think that's Lenin saying the truth is always concrete. The second example, quickly, the Constituent Assembly. Before the October Revolution, all the revolutionaries wanted the Constituent Assembly because that represented a demand that was going to break down Tsarism and break down the hold of, uh, of the ruling class. Once you get the Soviet seizing power, the demand for a constituent assembly is no longer a progressive demand, it becomes a regressive demand. It becomes a demand that actually the right wing are using to try and stop revolution. So the constituent assembly, you can't just have an abstract eternal view of it, oh we're for the constituent assembly. We're for the constituent assembly in this situation, but now we're against it because the truth is always concrete. Um, I'm hoping I'm not going too far on a tangent, um, but I was thinking about how fascinating it is, this idea that um, the authorities, the establishment, the state is always so frightened of the idea of change, and so common sense ideas, as we were speaking about, become so prevalent and people sort of latch onto them. Um, and I was thinking back to sort of my academic background, which is as a classicist, and thinking about how frightened Augustus was of Ovid, who wrote this epic poem about how everything is constantly changing, everything is constantly in flux, and this was seen as a really destabilising political poem about how nothing is concrete. And actually, if you look at the way the establishment have kind of responded to things that have happened in the media recently, it's quite telling how they, how they view any sort of shift with great fear and suspicion and as something anomalous that you can almost ignore. So um, there was a BBC World Service talk quite recently um, by their political correspondent who has spent the whole run up to the election just sort of saying things like, the British people aren't very political. That's a sort of truism that I'm going to throw out there. And the title of the talk was, Something Happened, But What? And this sort of total sort of like, we don't know. And yet, the fact is, if he went and spoke to people who were affected by austerity, who had been subject to any of the shifts and situations that have happened, who had, were living in social housing, who had seen people becoming homeless, who had seen people having to go through sort of the rigours of the DUP changing expectations, actually, it's quite easy to explain. We can find those explanations, but it requires a shift away from the establishment's ideas of how things always are and how they always will be. And I think it's quite exciting how things are changing at the moment. So I hope that wasn't too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, my question has come out of what I've listened to at this particular session. And my question is for hopefully Camilla to answer in the time she's got. And I'd be interested in what your answer to this question would be. So if you see me over lunch and you're minded to, just come up and talk to me. And that question is, from what you said, Camilla, and what you've said up here, I want to know who you think, Camilla, should control the dialectic and why. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting question. I suppose the answer is that nobody really does do they? That's the whole point of it. I, I think the point I want to make as well is when I first came across the arguments around the dialectic, I thought it was something that kind of applied to our class and actually it applies to the ruling class as well. And if you think about the election, um, the Brexit vote meant that Theresa May assumed that she was in a very strong position. She called a snap election. 
based on her assessment and the ruling class's assessment that it was about you know people being very racist and very right wing and therefore she'd be able to walk through an election very quickly you know sort out things for the next couple of years uh, and, and, and get get their way and to some extent actually when the election was called I kind of went with that because you know we were devastated were we in terms of shit we've got six weeks to sort of get our act together this is going to be really really difficult what we you know even as a, I've been a revolutionary for, for all my adult life and and you know even even we slip we don't always see what's coming the thing that made the difference for me was when um, there was the bombing in Manchester and I, I think most people on the left, their hearts sank and thought, oh my God, this is going to play into the hands of the right wing so very, very clearly, because it always has before. You know, we've got plenty of examples of that. And then actually Corbyn went on to the TV and did a fantastic talk about foreign policy. And then you suddenly saw, I don't think he shifted it just with that speech, what you suddenly saw was that anger and that uh, sense on, on our side really of being of immigrants being blamed constantly for the ills of society and austerity and people starting to make sense of actually this is more than just about blaming black people and about racism and then suddenly what you saw was um, a shift taking place that actually went to the left for the first time I think since I've, the you know, first time in terms of a terrorist bombing where you've seen that shift go, go that way and I think one of the things for me was that people saw the YouTube um, of a Muslim guy in Manchester who basically uh, put a blindfold on himself and said I trust you, do you trust me? and had queues of people giving him a free hug and you know those kind of things where they're very symbolic in a sense but very very important I think that it brought home to me that we're all dialectic and the ruling class are very very dialectic but sometimes they get it wrong because their interpretation of what's going on in society and their complete lack of understanding about what it means for our class to be, uh, you know, zero hours contracts and all that cult and, and how that builds up and builds up in the way that Camilla's described so that you have a sense of an explosion starting to take place. Now, the thing we don't know is what's going to happen because it isn't pre-written. But what we do know, what we're learning from this period is that the more that the left galvanises itself and starts to engage with people and starts to build unity, then the much better chance we have of bringing down the Tory government soon, hopefully getting Corbyn elected. But much more than that, of starting to move forward in a way that we've dreamt of for the last 30 odd years probably, in terms of class struggle taking off in Britain, the inspiration it gives to other parts of the, uh, of the world in the way that we've inspired them as well, and that things can happen. But the problem is it's not written down, it's not, you can't take it for granted. What we do now is the important thing, the agency, our actions are absolutely the most important thing, but also what matters is what they do in response to us. We've got to be in power, we've got to take control in that sense, but nobody really controls the di dialectic, all we control is our actions. Time for a couple of more uh, contributions, so don't be shy. I've got it wrong with the dialectic as well. I thought that there'd be more hands coming <laughs> up at the end of this session rather than the beginning, but there you go. You can't control the dialectic, I think. Go on, ready? Over there. Oh, comrades, I had a number of questions to ask young Camilla, but uh, I've uh, I picked one which is rather, uh, uh, rather different, shall we say. I'd like to uh, ask Camilla uh, what she feels about uh, laws. How does the uh, uh, formation of laws and rules relate to the dialectic? Thank you. You've got five extra minutes to, to sum up, Camilla. I think you might possibly need that as well. So thank you, comments. Thanks. Um, I'll try and cover a, as much of that um, as I can. Um, I'd like to recommend a couple of books as well. Um, John Molyneux's um, introduction, The Point is to Change It to Marxist Philosophy, has been really um, groundbreaking, really useful in terms of explaining things um, very clearly using, using language that we can all understand. Um, John Rees's book, The Algebra of Revolution, is a, also a stunning book that goes through in much more detail how the dialectic has been used from different uh, different thinkers from Hegel through to, through to Lenin, Luke Katch, Marx, Marx and Engels and, you know, and the way that it was rejected by other thinkers as well in the Marxist history. Um, so that's, you know, if you want, um, yeah, the book on the dialectics is, is that one. 
Um, I didn't talk um, much about, about the thesis and antithesis and synthesis. Um, I think it is, it is useful, but I don't think it's the main point to kind of draw out um, of a meeting on dialectics. It's um, an idea that goes back, actually, again, to Greek philosophy. Uh, so we have rhetoric, which is one person speaking to a, a, an audience of people, but uh, the dialectic for the Greeks was, was you know, the other way of doing an argument other than rhetoric. So in their dialectics, you had you know, one person says something, another person says something that's the opposite point of view from the first person, and then you know, the first person comes back and they try to come up with you know, a better idea that kind of, you know, it's not, it's not between the two ideas of, of the other, that's a sort of liberal, wishy-washy way of doing things. It's an idea that's better than the first idea because it's had that counter-argument. So for them, it's a, it's a method of arguing and a method of, of laying out your ideas. And, you know, Plato used to write down these sort of imagined conversations between different sort of characters as a way of laying out philosophical ideas. It turns up again in, in Hegel in, in the way that one idea encounters contradictions which lead to, lead to another idea and then uh, a further idea supersedes that. Um, so I think it is, you know, the Greeks understood dialectics very differently from, from how Marx would or how, how we would. I think there's something of that in the way we think about dialectics now, but it can be seen in, in a bit of um, in a determinist way, you know, come back to the way the Stalinists saw it, they thought that thesis capitalism, antithesis is the workers, synthesis is socialism, and that's, you know, it's, it's too simplistic, it doesn't explain how the world actually works, it's too, too mechanical. I think to to be you know to be just the thing that we talk about when we talk about dialectics. Um, I think someone said it's a dichotomous way of a way of seeing things. Um, yeah, sublation relates. Is it sublation or sublimation? Uh, this is a word that's. Hegel actually used the word Aufheben, which is a word in German that has no translation into English, so people have come up with various ways of trying to <laughs> express what it means in English, and none of them really get it. But as, um, Aufheben is where something something is overcome, but at the same time as being overcome, I think it's raised raised to a higher level at the same time as it's it's overcome. So it's a, diff a difficult kind of kind of idea to get your head around, but that's one of the kind of ideas he talks about when he talks talks about um, talks about his dialectics. Um, it's just of going from from the abstract to the concrete, I think, are very important. Um, people you know, might have seen Joseph Chinara talk about, about capital, um, and I think there's, there's videos of, of him talking about how to read capital where he talks about this. Um, it's in his book as well, where he talks about Marx's method of going, of starting with, Marx's method in, capitalist, in capital starts with with concepts of the commodity and the processes that go into a commodity, like the use value and the exchange value in that commodity. So it starts quite abstract if you read through capital and ends up very, very concrete with the way that, that things where the things were and you know housing situation for workers and how many hours they were working and imperialism and and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think what Marx is doing, I think it's absolutely right to say that you start from the concrete before you go into those abstract concepts and then go back to how they relate concretely. But you need to have that abstract, that bit of abstraction in the middle of it. Um, Marx said that if um, I think if our perception of things, you know. Was the same. It was the same as the surface appearance of things, and there'll be no no need for science, no need for, for the, including no need for the Marxist method. So you can't just start from the concrete and say that's how things are. What he's trying to get at is what's underlying the way that society looks. What are those those processes and um, are underlying the way things things really are? You know, things like use value and exchange value that you can't immediately see if you just look at the surface appearance of society, but you need to understand them in order to really understand what's going on with capitalism, exploitation being being his key kind of, um, you know, the results of his, his analysis is he understands exploitation that's hidden from us um, because it's in the way of production. Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, absolutely right to talk about about Darwin um, and about processes in nature. There's a whole debate about whether there's a, a dialectic in nature, but I think, um, you know, Engels wrote about dialectics of nature. I don't think it's you know, really feasible that Marx didn't, didn't agree with Engels about dialectics of nature. And I think that we can see dialectical processes in nature, you talk about fruit rotting and suddenly turning into something else. You know, Marx was, you know, um, 
it, it, tremendously inspired by Darwin. He said that when you see the way that, that species change from one species to another species throughout history, he said that is the evidence in natural history for our view of history, meaning historical materialism, which, which we're going to talk a, about. Um, again, you know, even though Darwin is not a radical thinker, let alone a revolutionary thinker, he's quite a, quite a bourgeois thinker, yeah, he discovered this process of, of change that things aren't always, you know, the same as, you know, things aren't always the same as they are at the moment in in the natural world, um, which was really influential um, on Marx. Um, you know, despite his own his own not particularly radical radical views. Um, how should we think about the relationship between uh, the individual and society? And um, that's a big question. It's a very good question. Um, I think clearly it's not as <laughs> simple as just seeing society as one individual plus another individual plus another individual, and once you put them all together, you get society. Um, if we're thinking about it dialectically, individuals must take something from, individuals must relate to the society in which they find themselves, and also react back and change, change society, and this must happen at, at different levels because there are different elements of society, there are different groups of individuals within society, the family, you know, a party, a religion, a, uh, you know, an institution or whatever. So it's not even as simple as there's the individual and then the big level of society. There must be multiple levels at work all relating to each other uh, in a complicated way. Um, I think once, once you see um, something like a society is dynamic, you start to, to get at something about what dialectics tells us about, about society. If you see things as static, then it is just one individual, another individual, another individual, that's society. Once you see everything as happening in a process, then you get more of an idea that it's a, a complex of interrelating processes. I think Engels said that you know, once we see everything as staying still, then, then we can't really understand, understand the world. Once we see things as changing, then that's where you start to encounter, encounter contradictions. Um, yeah, none of that really explains how a particular society works. You have to go out and do sociology and, and find out um, concretely how a particular society particular society works. Um, the new materialism, I probably don't have time to go into in detail. Um, I, I wrote a paper on it, actually, and I really didn't expect to be asked a question about it, but I think I guess that shows how, how influential some of these, these ideas are. The idea that agency isn't just something that humans possess, that it's not just us that are acting on the world, that agency is distributed, and that, you know, in a, in a sense, that the non-human world also, well, it's not that it has agency, because agency isn't something that it possesses, but agency is distributed throughout the world rather than us just acting on the world and the rest of the world being, being just mute and base and, and solid and things. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a very influential idea. I think it's tremendously important. I think there's a lot of, you know, and it's a broad idea as well, they don't all agree with each other, but I think these are ideas that, that do make us think and do challenge um, what we think as Marxists. Um, I think you're right to say that some of the criticisms of Marxism coming from these, these ideas are criticisms of a sort of straw figure of, of what Marxism is about. I don't think, I mean, I don't think that Marxism is dualist, I don't think it is just about only humans as having agency and just acting on an inanimate world. Um, you know, I tried to go through its, you know, its development, the way it moves away from Cartesianism, which, which, which is kind of the foundation of, of dualism. Um, so I think they, they misrepresent Marxism, but they also do, do pose a challenge. Um, I think their, their ideas are important in how we think about, about the environment and, you know, we need to think about ourselves as part of the environment, for example, and not just, um, you know, treat the environment as something that happens separately from us, which Marx would also agree with as well. Um, so, yeah, I can send you more things on, on new materialism or anyone if you're, you're interested in, in that particular philosophy. Um, so who should control the dialectic and why? Um, I, don't know, I wasn't quite sure whether it was a, a question about actual dialectical processes going on in, in the world and whether there's any control over them or whether it was who controls the knowledge of of the dialectic, I mean, if it's if it's who controls the knowledge of the dialectic, I think I think that people do understand elements of it, and that it does make a different bits of it do make sense to people. But we need to to um, you know, as party members, we need to learn our philosophy and need need to um, 
need, need to kind of consciously um, try to understand, to understand more about dialectics and where our ideas our ideas come from, and try and, and try and um, and try and learn this. It's you know, it's not just the possession of of an educated small group of people um, that understand the dialectic, and we tell everyone else what to do. But you know, on the other hand, we do need to do need to try and uh, try and try and be the best elements of the working class, and try and try and um, be the most self-conscious dialectical thinkers um, that we can. Um, which brings me on to the kind of uh, the idea about um, about struggle coming out coming out of nowhere. Um, you know, I think it's absolutely. I think it's right that people say that um, people see struggle occurring and think, oh, that came out of nowhere, where did that come from? Um, I remember actually, it's interesting that people use the example of the Grenfell Tower. I, was, um, I went to one of the protests immediately after it, um, where it seemed like that literally protests were breaking out spontaneously. Like someone called me up and said, you know, people have just started protesting don't know where it came from, but they're all just suddenly starting starting marching and things. So you know, I went went down there, and there was indeed a, a protest um, right underneath the tower. And but so, you know, I talked talked to one of my comrades, and he said, you know, actually, these this anger has been building up for years and years and, and months and months, and people aren't being listened to. And now that the anger that's been building up has broken out, and I think that's that's absolutely right. That is that is the way the way that it was. Um, um, but that um, when we talk about gradual change and talk about sudden spontaneous change, I think it's important to note that the gradual change isn't something separate from from the spontaneity and, and the revolts and revolutions. That the two are that two are interlinked themselves, and that one can't happen with, without the other um, in a kind of dialectical way in itself. Um, so you know we spend. Well, well, I know I spend most Saturdays you know, out, outside selling socialist worker and trying selling one copy at a time and trying to find contacts and trying to, to recruit people to the party and trying to build up slowly and sometimes it can seem quite quite monotonous and quite quite kind of routine but that that is all important and that gradual building up of an organisation is something that should um, hopefully give us give us the type of organisation we need when spontaneous uh, change does occur and when things change quite quickly. Um, it's an example of um, you know, the International Socialists, which was what um, the SWP was called before. You know, it's a predecessor to the SWP. Uh, in 1968, when we went into that year of, of great tumult around, around the world in 1968, we had about 400 members um, in the, in the organisation at the time. came out of that year with 1,000 members but we wouldn't have had the 1,000 members coming out of the year if we didn't have the 400 going into that year, if we didn't have those people spread out <coughs> around the country arguing for socialist ideas. So, so what we're doing here and now is about building up, uh, building up networks and building up things for, for when, when the big changes, changes do happen. <coughs>